Now I have to say something. I meant to say it during the announcements and I didn't. Last week and now this week, there are a bunch of you here that haven't been able to be here in a long time. And I just want you to know I thank God to see you come in the door and sitting here in church and worshiping with us. So, it's good to see you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you walk with us through this whole year and that you have loved us. Continue, Lord, to protect the family here. And Lord, as we gather around your word this morning, Grant that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth would focus on you. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't go to church because they're a bunch of hypocrites. Ever hear that? Any of you? I've heard a lot of variations of that over the years. Wow, you should have seen the way they treat each other in that church. You should have gone to that meeting, heard the things they said. You should hear what they say about each other. That's why I don't go. It's all a show. That's something else I've heard somebody say. People get all dressed up and they put on a show for one. They're trying to impress one another. Pastor, I know people go to that church because it's good for business. This is one I've read. I love Jesus. It's Christians I can't stand. Now I hear those things and my first reaction is often anger, defensiveness, I want to argue, but I keep running into one problem. A lot of times it's true. We are, all of us, sinners. And every single one of us is guilty of hypocrisy. Yours truly included. It's true. And sometimes, the way we talk to and about one another does more harm than good to our witness. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That's, Fishers is not the only congregation of which that is true. It's true of every single congregation of Christians into which you would ever go. And it has always been true, even among the disciples. And if we need the perfect example, we need to go no further than the guy who's at the heart of today's text, Peter. All right? You know the story. I'm not gonna, before I even get to the one in here, you know the one that's really famous. While Jesus is on trial, what was Peter doing? Denying him three times. Another story that comes to mind from Peter's life was at a church in Antioch. Antioch is a, a church up, it's on the, it would have been on the kind of the south um, coast of what is today Turkey, I believe, and, or Syria, I'm not sure which, and it's along the Mediterranean, and it's the first place where it was a really Gentile church. And Peter had gone up there on behalf of the church in Jerusalem to see what was happening. And when he first got there, he was, he was fine hanging around with the Gentiles until all 
until some Jews from Jerusalem came. And then I want you to see what Paul wrote about this in Galatians 2. He says, when they came, he drew back, separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. What are they going to say? What are they going to do? And the rest of the Jews who were there acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that was his more familiar name, Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? He rebuked Peter in front of everybody. Of course, we know from today's gospel that's not the first time it's happened to Peter. Right? Right after Peter makes his great confession, Jesus begins to tell them, right? He's, he begins to say to them, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and three days later, rise again. And the Bible says Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Matthew even tells us what Peter said. Far be it from you, Lord. This will never happen to you. Think about that. Peter is one of the 12. Peter is one of his closest friends. And here is Peter trying to stand in the way of what God sent Jesus to do. Folks, when we gossip, about one another. When we stab each other in the back. When we pout because things aren't going the way we want them to. When we sin. We stand in God's way. Sometimes we act more like enemies of Jesus than friends. I want you to notice in our text how Jesus responds to such friendly opposition. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't act like it never happened. He doesn't make excuses for Peter. He doesn't say, well, Peter's a good guy. He means well. His heart is in the right place. He doesn't say any of that at all, does he? Jesus loves Peter, and he loves us too much to ignore our friendly opposition. Jesus is just plain blunt with Peter. Get See, seeing the, the disciples, he rebuked Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan. You have in, not in mind the things of God, but the things of man. And folks, there are times when our Lord would say the same thing to you and me. I remember one time way back when I was in, in youth group. When I was a teenager, we had a friend from a high school band come to our youth group meeting. He didn't have a church. His family didn't go to church. He'd come a couple weeks, but we got in this argument, and I don't remember exactly what was going on, except that we were really mean to each other. And in the middle of it, he just got up and started to leave. We kind of looked at him. He looked at us, and he said, I thought you guys had something special here, that maybe this faith thing was real. I guess not. And he left. See, that day Jesus used that man, young man, to be blunt with us. You have not in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Get behind me, Satan. So Jesus doesn't ignore it. He confronts sin in us. I forgot to say that before. Do you know what else he doesn't do? 
He doesn't turn us away. That's how he deals with opposition. He doesn't turn us away. That's why he had to suffer many things. That's why Jesus had to be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and the third day be raised. Think of what he did when they came out to arrest him. He surrendered. When they lied about him, he refused to speak in his own defense. I love the words of the prophet Isaiah that describe that moment, right? He was oppressed, this Jesus, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. You know what he did when he did open his mouth? He prayed for those who lied about him. For those who betrayed him. He prayed for you and me. Father, forgive them. Why? He was on his cross for you and me. God was in Christ reconciling the world, reconciling us to himself, not counting men's sins against them. Yeah, his, his response to opposition is his cross. Not only did Jesus go to his cross, and kids, here's what I was talking about in the children's message, he also calls us to the cross. That's how he responds to Peter, to his disciples, to you and me. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, taking up our cross is to be as much a part of our spiritual life as breathing is part of our physical lives. We are called to a life of daily dying to sin and rising to new life. That's the life that God gave birth to in you at your baptism. I want you to look at what St. Paul wrote about the meaning of baptism. He says, uh, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that what it means? That, that you know, God's going to forgive us anyway, so we're free just to, just to go on sinning? Is that what it means? Look what he says. By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. God has called us to a life of daily being nailed to our own cross and raised to life, putting to death sin and living a new life, being crucified with Christ so it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. I love what we learned in catechism, remember from the small catechism, Luther's explanation of, of baptism, the last question, what does baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam, that's that sinful hypocrite in us, should by daily contrition, contrition is being deeply sorry over our sin, by daily contrition and repentance, turning away from that life, be drowned 
and die. Drowning is a pretty strong word for death, isn't it? It should be drowned and die with all sin and evil desires so that a new man should how often daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. That's how Jesus responds to sin in us. He nails it to the cross and gives it a new life, gives us a new life. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? How does that work out in life? Well, folks, it it, it always means doing what we did at the beginning of the service. It means confessing to God the truth about ourselves. I, a poor, miserable sinner, right? And that was... St. John is telling us in his epistle, he says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, while we, in other words, while we refuse to confess our sins, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, if we bring it out into the open, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And what happens? The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yet it means coming to God every day in confession. Sometimes... It means confessing to each other. To a pastor, to a friend you trust. I don't know if it's you, but when I was in catechism, Pastor Miles told us, he said, you know, sometimes, he says, we don't demand private confession in our church, but it's there. Why? Because sometimes you struggle with something. And I used to think in my mind that it was, you struggle with, you just have trouble believing that God forgives you. And, And that's true. But it also is in our lives that we all have things that we struggle with. That are problems in our lives. And sometimes we can't battle that alone. And so that's why we confess to one another. So we can strengthen one another and hold one another accountable. And so that we have somebody that we see who can look at us and know what's going on and say, yeah, God knows that. And he loves you. And he forgives you. That's part of taking up your cross. You want to know another part of taking up your cross? It's forgiving yourself. You know, when we, when we refuse to forgive ourselves, we think we're bigger than God because he paid the price for us and he forgives us. What would make us think that we know better than him? And when we don't forgive ourselves, we hurt everybody around us. We do. Okay? Sometimes it can mean going to somebody we've hurt and saying, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. How can I make it up to you? That's taking up your cross. It can also be forgiving someone who's hurt you. You know, when you hold a grudge, or when I hold a grudge, the only person we're hurting is ourselves. When you hold a grudge, you give that other person free rent in your head. When you hold a grudge, when you continue to resent, it's like drinking poison and expecting it to kill the other person. Taking up your cross means crucifying your pride and forgiving the way God has forgiven you. Now, I know none of that sounds easy, does it? So I told the kids, taking up your cross isn't easy. Can we worry? What are people going to think if they know the truth about me? Will they love me? What if they don't want to be forgiven? What if, what if they hold it against me? Stick, quit focusing on them. 
You're not called to take up your cross and follow yourself. You're not called to take up your cross and follow them. You're called to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Focus on his promise. I love these words from the Apostle James. It says, uh, The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. You may That's a promise of God. That's what same thing that Jesus is saying in our text. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so, yes, when you come here, you find in the people around you and in yourself sinners and hypocrites. Folks, that's who this place exists for. That's why we come here. Because Jesus meets us here. Because here, he brings healing and forgiveness and grace to bear on your life and mine. Here we encounter him and he encounters us. He puts to death the old you, brings to life the new. And you know what? Hypocrites are not just found here. They're everywhere around us. So invite them to come with you. Church is a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, we could use one more. Because you know what? Jesus loves them too. And he wants to encounter them. Forgive them. And give them new life. Amen? Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life that is everlasting. Amen.